So the Stanley Milgram experiment is famous, but the next one is the most famous experiment of all in the history of social psychology. This is the Stanford Prison Experiment, run by Philip Zimbardo in 1971. This was conducted again at a US institution, a very, very respected university, Stanford, experiment, Stanford University, in the psychology department. And as with Milgram, volunteers here were um, told they were going to be randomly assigned to one of two roles. And in this case, it wasn't a lie. They were either randomly assigned to the role of the guards or randomly assigned to the role of the prisoners. Much like the Milgram experiment, human society here consists only of men. There's no women involved. Well, there's one woman who plays a cameo role. Um, the plan was to create a fake prison, let it run for 14 days, observe, learn what you can. But it was ended prematurely after six days, and here's the only woman in the story after Zimbardo's girlfriend raised concerns about the well-being of the volunteers. We need to get some things straight about the Stanford Prison Experiment. This was not a scientific experiment. It is often mistaken, mistakenly treated as if it were. It was not conducted in a manner that could have ever informed science. So it was mistaken from the get-go. And it did not lead to any conclusions we can rely upon. Please do not draw conclusions from this that are in line with the pronouncements of those who ran the experiment. In what follows, I'm going to cleanly separate three things. We're going to look at what happened in 1971 in the basement of Stanford Prison. Then we're going to look at the myths and stories around that event, many of which have been propagated by Philip Zimbardo, the investigator at the center of all this. And then we're going to look at the social consequences of such myths. So starting with the events of 1971, the entire basement of the psychology department in Stanford was rigged up as a mock prison. Volunteers, were those who were assigned the roles of prisoners, were arrested at their residences. A lot of cosplay, a lot of role play going on here. They were issued what were described as prison issue uniforms, but are actually surgical gowns open down the back. The point being to humiliate the person wearing them. They don't, they, they're not relevant to a prison situation. That's not the kind of clothes you get in prison. They were placed in cells. They were given limited freedom to exercise and to interact with each other. And conditions deteriorated. Some guards acted in an abusive manner. Some prisoners exhibited signs of anxiety or trauma. Importantly, Zimbardo was on the floor of the uh, fake prison most of the time, egging the volunteers on and obviously, clearly, manifestly affecting their behaviour. And the whole thing was called off after six days. So much for the events. What about the myths? Well, the main source of documentation we have available to us is a website which is curated by Philip Zimbardo himself. And this perpetuates all the known myths about the experiment. You can see images there on the left-hand side that are taken from this. You can see the clothes that Zimbardo chose to dress people up in. This website will give you an entirely biased view of what happened there in line with Zimbardo's own view of things. And your required reading for this week is a report from one of the people who played the roles of the guards in the Sanford Prison experiment. He, a few years ago, did an I am a on Reddit. Perhaps you've met these before, where people who have interesting stories to tell answer questions from the public. You will get a very, very different interpretation of events there. One interpretation that's often repeated is that the brutality of the guards and the suffering of the prisoners resulted in the experiment being abandoned after only six days. This grotesquely misrepresents and simplifies things. With this framing, it has been suggested that the guards became depersonalized in the group. Their role caused them to lose their individuality. And from this, the equally absurd claim is often made that tyranny is embedded in the psychology of powerful groups, that the social roles create group norms and people simply comply with them. Please do not treat such stories uncritically. The idea that group norms give rise or compel people to believe in one way or another is not to be believed and certainly not in the manner in which it is presented here, despite the fact that there's a lot to talk about there. These assertions are not supported by any scientific evidence, but they are pushed by Zimbardo himself, who remains, unfortunately, a psychologist in some kind of standing. Criticism of the Stanford Prison Experiment has been 
exerted throughout the um, the whole time since it happened. But it has become very, very loud in the last few years where people finally seem to have realized that this was a complete disaster that has no place in science. It never was an experiment. There was no conditions. There was no analysis. There was no data, no organized data collection. There was no peer review. There was no publications that demonstrate scientific results. None of that, what we call science, happened. There was a lot of role play. The uh, stories that are told about the submissive attitude of prisoners is countered by reports from prisoners themselves who did resist the mistreatment that they were subjected to. And the guards themselves, as you will find out for yourself, did not uniformly act in a tyrannical manner. Zimbardo's role in the middle egging people on here is absurd and completely destroys any claim to credibility of this experiment. So when you see claims like this claim short issued by someone called Haney shortly afterwards, guard aggression was emitted simply as a consequence of being in the uniform of a guard and asserting the power inherent in that role. I want you to be critical of such things. I do not want you to accept them at face value. If we accept this at face value, it provides political cover for people. If you treat the guard as if the guard has no choice and you assign responsibility for the behavior of the guard solely to the role or the, even worse, the clothes that they're wearing, you abdicate all responsibility. And here we come to the consequences. In 2003, the United States invaded Iraq after the, for some reason, after 2001 and the events of 9-11. One thing that happened there when they took over Baghdad was they took over a prison called Abu Ghraib, which was notorious as a site of torture and um, killing under Saddam Hussein. And the Americans continued to use it for torture and for killing. American soldiers documented this and those pictures leaked out and gave rise to a huge scandal. There were attempts to hold some people responsible. Who do you hold responsible? Well, it turned out to be politically expedient to be useful to appeal to the Stanford prison experiment and to call Philip Zimbardo as a so-called expert to attribute responsibility for the roles, the situational factors of what went on. And this, of course, abdicated all responsibility for those who organized the situation, gave the orders, set things up in the first place, all the way up to Donald Rumsfeld, the American political institution, found it convenient to insulate themselves by appealing to Zimbardo as some kind of a witness. Zimbardo went on after this to become the president of the American Psychological Association. He ought to be this thoroughly discredited from the scientific community as a result of this. And this Stanford prison experiment is still frequently misrepresented. There was a so-called, once more, we have a so-called partial replication from 2006, but that lay in the domain of reality TV. This is science gone severely badly wrong. <sighs> I've made it clear I think I'm not a fan of the Stanford prison experiment. Why does social psychology throw us up these problematic studies? Milgram, at least, was trying to find out something that was really urgent. Well, we have to look back at the time, the early 1970s. We've got the civil rights movement in America. We've got frequent news reports and everyone's seeing things on their television. They're seeing race riots. They're seeing civil disorder. We've got the Vietnam War going on. We've got massive protests. There was almost a civil war in America. There was violence between citizens and people in uniform on all the time. American society was very, very fragile. People were seeing this kind of image for the first time every day in the news. We're saturated with this. We're used to this. But that gives you the backdrop against which this kind of study seemed to make sense to people. It doesn't make sense to us now. And it can, we can still learn an awful lot from it. But what we should not do is treat it as a scientific experiment.